With your hosts, Lily Mundy, Raj Parikh, and Kyle Sanak, this is the award-winning PRS Journal Club podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the November 2019 edition of PRS Journal Club podcast. I'm Raj Parikh from Washington University in St. Louis, and I'm joined by my co-resident ambassadors, Kyle Sanek from UT Southwestern and Lily Mundy from Duke University. Today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Michael Neumeister, Chairman of the Department of Surgery and Professor of Plastic Surgery at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. Thank you so much, Dr. Neumeister, for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. This is great, and it's an honor to be here. The articles that we will discuss on this PRS Journal Club podcast can be read for free on prsjournal.com, including an archive of all past Journal Club articles. The article we will be discussing is an algorithm for free perforator flap selection in lower extremity reconstruction based on 563 cases. This article is from Dr. J.P. Hong's group at the Asan Medical Center in Seoul, Korea, and his co-authors. I'll briefly summarize the paper, and then we'll jump right in with a few questions for Dr. Neumeister to get his thoughts, as well as Lily and Kyle's thoughts on this paper. The authors conducted a retrospective review over a seven-year period from 2010 to 2017, looking at free flat perforator reconstruction for lower extremity wounds, including acute and traumatic wounds. They calculated and documented demographics, comorbidities, defect characteristics, as well as operative details, including flap type, dimensions, flap thickness, the plane of elevation, whether it's superfascial or subfascial, other factors such as flap composition, skin and subcutaneous versus chimeric flaps, and as well as post-operative outcomes and secondary procedures that were needed. The goal of this paper was to create an algorithm to select free perforator flaps that could be tailored specifically to lower extremity wounds based on the defect and other patient characteristics. So the authors found 563 perforator flaps that they had completed over the seven-year period. A majority of these were a combination of skip flaps or ALT flaps, so superficial circumflex iliac artery perforator flaps, the anterolateral thigh perforator flaps were the predominant amount, but they also did a variety of different flaps just depending on the defect size, including deeps, TDAPs, gap flaps, and then uh, free fibular and chimeric flaps as well as posterior interosseous artery flaps. Ultimately, the authors evaluated their outcomes and they had a very high success rate, what you'd expect uh, from a group with such an excellent experience. And then they really try to propose an algorithm, and I think that's kind of where a lot of the discussion is. And in their algorithm, when they looked at all of their flaps and reviewed it, they basically proposed five criteria, and that's patient position, defect size, flap thickness, flap composition, and the pedicle length required. And they believe that if you look at these factors, that you can select really the ideal flap based on an individual patient approach. And then they go through these factors each and essentially discuss in which scenarios would they choose certain flaps. And it seems to be obviously the skip and the ALT predominated in their series. And that's because a majority of their patients, or 92%, were done supine. And then when they need a smaller to medium-sized flap, they tend to do a skip. And then when they need a larger flap, they tend to do an ALT. Now, understanding that the population is very different in Seoul, Korea, compared to where Dr. Neumeister is in the Midwest and where Kyle Lilly and I are, uh, different parts of the South and the Midwest, where the patient BMIs and everything are a little different than this population, I still think it's a very interesting paper, and the reason I wanted to discuss it for the PRS Journal Club was because it goes through, really, a very uh, large experience with lower extremity perforator flaps, and you really get the benefit uh, from reading this paper from Dr. Hong's experience with this. So I wanted to jump right in, Dr. Neumeister, and get your thoughts on the paper as a whole. And then if when you do lower extremity reconstruction, and just, just focusing on, you know, there's no way to isolate out muscle flaps, but just focusing on perforator flaps, do you have a flap of choice? And then what is your algorithm that you use at SIU, both for acute and also chronic wounds? So as you mentioned, this is a review article. J.P. Hong is a phenomenal microsurgeon, and his group is well-known for doing these perforator flaps. As he mentions in the article, before something like 2008 there, they had an ALT, which is essentially their go-to flap, and the skip flap really became more and more popular with them, probably because of the donor site being able to be closed and it was extraordinarily thin so you could put it in many places and if you look at their results 51 percent of them are skip flaps and as you mentioned 33 percent are actually the alt flap 
So I like the volume that he has. I think it is tremendous and his experience is tremendous. Certainly his success rate is at 96% is great. And I believe in this day and age, we should all be attaining results that are in the high 90s, really. There were a couple of things that we should note about the paper itself. Some of these based on, on general principles of lower extremity reconstruction. Actually, principles of any type of free flap that we use. We no longer look at filling the hole only. So in years gone past, everyone was doing high fives in the OR, doing a little dance, you know, high praises when the flap was successful, but it was a chunk of meat on the lower extremity. And, you know, the contour wasn't great. The donor site may have had a uh, significant morbidity to it, but we got the hole filled. That was awesome. But that was then. That was way back then. Now we should be looking at donor sites that are minimalized. We should be looking at recipient sites that fit the contour and the aesthetic looks of what that recipient site looked like before there is any type of trauma or resection or defect in that area. So in this paper, he kind of highlights that, that he does want to be cognizant of the fact that there are two things we need to pay attention to, the recipient and the donor site. And also be aware though, that we all choose flaps that we like and we like them because in our hands they're very reliable and it's time efficient it's cost effective and if you can do something that is reliable and all the other parameters are wonderful that's your go-to flap for him it appears that it's the skip flap which is great then he should use it more and more often i think the body habitus has a lot to do with that and you have to Again, tailor that the skip flap may not be the best flap for someone if they find that that donor site does not fit the needs of the recipient site. Although this particular article was about perforator flaps, one could argue that if you're really to have an algorithm of flaps in the lower extremity, the muscle flaps, fascial flaps should also be included because in some patients with a certain body habitus, with large BMIs, we may find that we don't have a good choice without creating a big shark bite out of their leg, out of their belly, out of their thigh, wherever we're taking it from. Instead, we can take a perhaps serratus anterior fascia flap with a minimal scar, a single line incision down the thorax, and the contour is going to be extremely thin. Or a latissimus flap that it can actually be stretched out so it's not bulky in the lower extremity and you don't see things like biscuiting or a trapdoor kind of effect, and you don't have the need for uh, secondary procedures. Not necessarily the focus of his paper. His paper was really focusing on an algorithm for perforator flaps, and I get that, and I think that's good. But we as microsurgeons or lower extremity reconstructive surgeons really need to look at papers like this and say, Excellent if I really plan to do a perforator, but I think this recipient site needs a fascial flap only. And again, the donor site would be a straight line scar. In his results, they seem to indicate that if you need a lot of tissue, use a large flap. If you need a small amount of tissue, use a small flap. And I don't want to be coy about this, but the algorithm is very logical, but very intuitive. If you need bone or muscle in the flap, choose this type of flap. If you need something with lymph nodes, then you're going to use the skip flap. And that's what we should be doing. So those are in general my comments. I think the paper demonstrates the evolution of the type of flap that is the go-to flap since 2008. There are a few limitations that the uh, authors even make note of near the end of the paper. And I think those are things that we should actually also pay attention to because it's not a comparative study. It's just their case series over a period of time. They did not look critically at the aesthetic outcomes, but whether or not, you know, it wasn't documented that it was poor. And I think that should be done. And also they acknowledge that the statistical analysis may not have been as accurate or applied 
as many studies require. So overall, I like the study. It, it is a testament to the quality and skills of what that group does and that we should all be achieving and aspire to. Thank you, Dr. Umeister. I completely agree. I think those were some great thoughts. I think that really the goal when you look at reconstructive surgical principles of a lower extremity reconstruction, whether it's a chronic wound or acute traumatic wound, is a functional limb. So I think when you, we look at some of the limitations, you know, they look at secondary outcomes, but I, I do think, you know, looking at things such as functional outcomes and then, and then even patient reported outcomes going forward for these lower extremity reconstruction papers becomes more important. I also completely agree that I think when you approach lower extremity reconstruction, you really need to have everything in the armamentarium and deciding whether to do a perforator or a muscle flap really, I think, would be based on a lot of these factors that they propose, which, like you said, are very uh, just kind of common sense factors based on defect size, flap thickness, composition, and what requirements you need. And, you know, certainly in certain lower extremity wounds, gracilis flap, or as you mentioned, latissimus flap, they'll atrophy down and contour very nice without any secondary operations. Uh, can be very good operations with minimal donor site morbidity. You know, at our institution, our algorithm, at least for the chronic wounds, and out of his population, I think 25% were diabetic and 20% had peripheral vascular disease, but surprisingly, only 4% had one vessel runoff. And I think that is a little interesting because I would expect that more patients would have only a single vessel intact in such a high diabetic and peripheral vascular disease population. You know, I think with the skip flap, the major limitation we've had is just, just pedicle length and then you're limited up to five to six centimeters. And therefore, if you're doing like a TMA chronic wound coverage, if you don't go perforated or perforator, you don't have anything on the dorsal distal aspect, it's hard to find a vessel to plug into. So I think that's a limitation of the skip. So we really just look at if there's no main vessel flow, then we go perforate or perforator and do a skip. If there is any single vessel intact, if it's a thinner patient, we'll do an ALT. If we're doing a perforator flap, obviously now that discounts muscle flaps as well. So Lily and Kyle, I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on this paper. And then at Duke, Lily, what is your algorithm for some of these wounds? And then, you know, is, if you're just looking at perforator flaps, is there a flap that you have a preference for? You know, again, kind of like just reiterate a lot of the comments that we've had already, I think. J.P. Young's group, like, you know, he's such a master surgeon and his, you know, perforator, perforator anastomoses and just sort of his technical skills are so far superior to, I think, so many people in our field that it's really nice to kind of read his thought process and his algorithm for thinking about things. And again, it's, you know, pretty straightforward. I do enjoy that they separated things based out on patient positioning, because I think that's something that just from a practical standpoint, we're thinking about a lot for these patients not only for our portion of the case, but if we're doing a combination case with, you know, a group like orthopedics, what their positioning requirements are and how do we sort of optimize our flap choice to minimize repositioning and reprepping and things like that. You know, I think some things that could have been brought up, like you mentioned, the patient reported outcome data, but also they had such long follow-up in so many of these patients, but they didn't really provide even, you know, any of the you know, for the trauma patients like time to union or weight bearing status, which are, you know, in addition to patient reported outcomes and functional outcomes, really important to think about. In terms of our experience here at Duke, you know, I don't know if we have such a, you know, sort of like a rigorous algorithm for which flaps that we're choosing and more so just kind of evaluating each patient on a um, patient basis and, you know, thinking about many of the same things that are outlined in this paper, you know, the defect and what we're looking for in terms of flap thickness and pedicle length and how much length we need based on, you know, what our arterial inflow is going to be. But yeah, it's a great paper to read, especially as a resident, and really outlines things nicely for us. Thanks, Lily. Kyle? Yeah, Raj, I think, you know, we kind of do it in several different ways. Some of the issues we've had some with some of these like perforator flaps in a lot of the, the like diabetic population or people who have microvascular vessel disease at the extremity is some of the perforators themselves can have uh, vascular issues. So that's always kind of a concern for us. That being said, we have transitioned to more fitting the need of the defect in terms of what is their outcome going to be long term. So, you know, you want to make sure how fast can we get them into a regular shoe or things like that so they can go back to work, specifically in trauma or in the diabetic patient population. How fast can we get them into a boot? So we've kind of transitioned from just putting a big puffy muffin on there to trying to streamline it, whether that be with fascia flaps, with muscle flaps, or adipofascia flaps in the right patient population. With that being said, you know, sometimes at the end of the day, 
we're trying to salvage a, an extremity, you usually only have one really, really good chance at it. And so my thought is, is whatever the best flap that I have at my armamentarium to give them the best chance to get it right the very first time. And so that's kind of how I have been trained and how I think about the lower extremity reconstructions. Thanks, Kyle. One of the other interesting things I, I thought about this article was that probably, I think, 94, 93.9% of patients, so 510 of their patients out of the 563, they did a superficial elevation. Now their median BMI was 24, so I think that's, you know, obviously a, a little bit of a thinner population than some of us are used to operating on. But I think to do 94% superficial elevation, that's one thing I wanted to get your thoughts on, Dr. Neumeister. Because that's something, at least for the skip flaps, we do superficially. But for ALTs, traditionally, we have not done them that way. And I don't know if in somebody with a larger BMI, if that would make a substantial difference because that subcutaneous layer is still quite thick. And then the other thing was just a number of perforators was around 1.3. So most of these flaps are single perforator flaps, even though some of them were quite large ALTs. So I just want to get your thoughts on that, Dr. Newmaster. Do you traditionally do a superficial elevation when you're doing perforator flaps, or does it just kind of depend on a patient-to-patient -patient basis, on BMI and, and other factors on tissue depth and what you need? So a lot of it depends on, uh, first of all, what you need. You know, so if you need muscle, there's no point in doing that. You're going to go you know, below that fascia. It takes some muscle with it as well. But I do think if you've ever watched, you know, for instance, the way Fuchin Wei will actually elevate his ALT flap in a superfascial way, it's essentially right on top of the fascia on the leg there. We can do the same thing, even though the subcutaneous may be significantly thicker in our patient population. You can still do that, but you're basing it on and relying it completely on, as you scoot across there, on a, getting a good perforator that's going to come out. Uh, roughly where you you expect it to. So you have to have faith when you're doing that because there is some vascularity that kind of the, the fascia does have with it. I think it's easier to go subfascial actually because you just go straight down, you start elevating up and raises very quickly until you see the perforator and then you dive down around around that. But I think it helps close some of the defects if you stay superfascially. So if you can, I think it's probably a good idea. I think we can close more. Once you violate the fascia, those wounds, those uh, defects tend to spring open and it makes it harder and harder to try to close it without some type of skin graft. And we didn't talk about that, but if you have to put a skin graft on a donor site like the ALT, boy, that looks like a shark bite. You know, it, it doesn't look like a pretty defect afterwards, no matter who you are. You always have that versus a straight line scar. So if it helps you get that closure by keeping it super fascia, I think we should try to do that. And to the point where you get up to your comfort zone, if it's getting too close to where you think the main pedicle is, then you can dive down and have a smaller fascial defect perhaps. Essentially, I agree that we have to choose a flap that we think is right with our abilities and is good for the donor site and the recipient site. And a lot of times that may be something else than a perforator flap. The whole idea of perforator flaps is that you get so many more flaps with this, but you also attempt to limit the donor site morbidity with it. So I think it's worthwhile at least exploring, if you don't do them, exploring more and more of these perforator flaps. Thank you. I completely agree. I think with that, we will end the discussion of this article. Thank you, everyone, for a great discussion. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share with your colleagues and friends and rate us on the Apple iTunes store. Also remember to tune into the other two articles that we will be discussing on this month's podcast. Finally, please join us for our monthly journal club on Facebook, where we will be able to interact directly in real time with this month's selected articles authors. Go ahead and like the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Facebook page if you have not already done so. That's where our monthly journal club takes place. And once again, thank you, Dr. Master, so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Thank you for listening to the award-winning PRS Journal Club podcast. Be sure to read all of the articles being discussed, including some of the classic pairings from the archives, for free on prsjournal.com.